Hey guys, I'm back here with Hunt Lyman at the Hill School, and we're going to talk about some more John Keats. We're going to be talking about uh, To Autumn, and uh, before, I guess I'll just hand it over to, to Hunt and allow him to give any sort of preliminary remarks, and then get into the the marrow of the poem. All right, thanks. So um, this has been really interesting to me for a variety of reasons to go back and look at John Keats and uh, to sort of see the arc of this poem, or uh, the arc of the odes, and this poem is the final one. Uh, and I, I'd like to sort of introduce this one with uh, a couple of just personal stories. One is uh, we're sitting outside uh, where I work at Hill School, and at some point in the course of this, um, in the course of this fall, I will take both of my classes out here. And it'll be a pretty significant chunk of time because we have to actually walk out here and, you know, put our books down, all the rest. And we're going to sit here and I'm going to um, share this poem with them. Because this poem has come to me in my teaching uh, to be the moment where I actually accept that the summer's actually over and that, you know, we're, we're looking at winter and that autumn is upon us. Um, and I like the kids to have that moment, too. Um, but I think that in a more substantial sense... Uh, this poem is an extraordinary culmination to Keats's uh, poetic career. So I, just to review a couple things that I said before in our previous discussions on Ode to a Nightingale uh, and on a, uh, Ode on a Grecian Urn, um, this has been uh, was an, an extraordinary period in Keats's very young life. I mean, Keats died at 25. He wrote this poem at 24. I mean, think about what it's like to be that age. You know, it is, that's very, very young. Mm. And when you realize that all the things that had happened in Keats's life, from um, his father uh, dying from a fall from a horse, his mother dying of tuberculosis, his nursing of his brother Tom through the final stages of tuberculosis, his uh, love for Fanny Braun that was never going to go anywhere... Uh, that and and the the sort of trashing of his poems in contemporary critical reviews, um, it led to this point at the end of his life where over a period of a remarkably short number of months, he generated these fantastic odes. And we've talked about, I think, in my opinion, the greatest of them, uh, Ode uh, to a Nightingale, which is really a story about, uh, or a poem about feeling the, the frustration of knowing that the song of the nightingale lasts forever, whereas your life and your art, he believed, would be uh, so ephemeral and that it would die. Um, that's a very personal, very kind of anguished struggle in the course of that poem. Uh, Ode on a Grecian Urn, uh, much more of a of a kind of uh, of an interrogation of a human work of art to try to make it relinquish its secrets and coming to the realization that even though in some sense things do not fade and that the urn uh, uh, sort of causes imagination to complete the story, uh, it is also in itself incomplete because it is not human and does not feel the things that you that the audience needs to bring to it. But both of those poems, Nightingale and Urn, are, in my mind, really kind of anguished, you know, and they're full of this this energy, this uh, wanting to deny death, uh, wanting to find a way out, wanting to find something that's permanent. And this poem, To Autumn, just strikes me as extraordinarily heroic. Because here is this young guy who is, you know, recognizing, I mean, I think you can, uh, you can argue whether or not he knew he was going to die at this point in his life. I think there's an argument that maybe he didn't completely know. But, um, but here is somebody who is choosing to recognize that autumn is its own season, and it has its own beauty. And even if you really wish that it was still summer, and that you really wish that the winter wasn't coming, you don't have any choice about it. And so the best thing that you can do is appreciate what is there. And so that's how, that's overall, that's kind of what I see as the keynote to the poem. That's what I, what I like to think of as, you know, sounding the most important um, message of it. But there are some other things that he does that I think are worth listening to, too. And I, I know Lindsay and I began last time by reading the poem at the beginning, and I've often done it at the end. And so now I'm doing it a different way today. Because sure. this is the shortest poem, too. This is three stanzas. It's a lot shorter than the others. So some things to look for in this poem, because the poem, unlike Nightingale and Urn, this is not a poem that, it, that you're going to find particularly difficult to understand. It's going to be, uh, it's going to work almost right away. Um, 
but there are some things that are subtle about it that are really worth paying attention to, too. So here, here are a few things that I think people tend to look for in this poem. Um, one is the, the personification of Autumn. So Autumn is seen as a young uh, woman in this, uh, at least in the second stanza of this ode, um, and she is doing certain things, and she is also not doing certain things, and I think that's really worth looking at. Um, and so we'll talk about that once we go through the poem. A second thing to be aware, uh, subtle, or maybe I'm just slow to get it, but uh, the, the way that he handles time. So the poem is going to move in, in two ways. It's going to move through a day in autumn. In other words, the first stanza is going to be uh, mostly early day. There's going to be a noonday second stanza and then a, a twilight third stanza. But it's also going to move through the course of the seasons, uh, of the season itself. So it's going to begin in early autumn and end in late autumn. Um, I, would, I would also pay attention to uh, images of fullness because a big part of this is, you know, him thinking about uh, and his describing uh, the plentitude of autumn, the harvest that is happening. And he does that in a number of ways through his word choice, through the length of his lines, through the length of his sentences. Um, he's going to really develop that idea of something being full. Um, and what is, I think, also characteristic of Keats and what people always think of with Keats is, you know, his very sensual, concrete imagery. You know, the, the pictures, the very specific pictures that he puts in his mind. And I, I just say, finally, as a backdrop to all of that, you know, to just be aware of the heroism um, of this poem as, you know, part of his project in terms of where it falls in his personal life and the way that it resonates with what was happening in his own life. So that gives you a few things maybe to think yeah. about as we go through it. Totally. So this is uh, To Autumn by John Keats. Season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, close bosom friend of the maturing sun, conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run, to bend with apples the moss cottage trees and fill off fruit with ripeness to the core, to swell the gourd and plump the hazel shell with a sweet kernel, to set budding more and still more, later flowers for the bees until they think warm days will never cease, for summer has o'er brim their clammy cells. Who hath not seen thee oft amid thy store? Sometimes who e'er seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor, thy hair soft lifted by a winnowing wind or on a half-reap furrow, sound asleep, drowsed by the fume of poppies while thy hook spares the next swath and all its twined flowers. And sometimes, like a gleaner, thou dost keep steady thy laden head across a brook, or by a cider press, with patient look, thou watchest the last oozings, hours by hours. Where are the songs of spring? Ay, where are they? Think not of them, thou hast thy music too. While barred clouds bloom the soft dying day and touch the stubble plains with rosy hue, then in a wailful choir the small gnats mourn among the river sallows borne aloft or sinking as the light wind lives and dies. Full grown lambs loud bleat from hilly born, hedge crickets sing, and now with treble soft a red breast whistles from a garden croft and gathering swallows twitter in the skies. Anything I missed there? Nope. Okay. So I want to go through this uh, stanza by stanza, but to, I, I want to, um, you know, I don't want to repeat everything that we were just saying before, sure. so I just want to highlight things a little yeah. bit more. So at the beginning, right, he is speak. it's interesting, he's speaking, it is to Autumn, right, it's not owed on a Grecian, or it's not on Autumn, you know, again, and he's speaking directly to her, apostrophizing her, season of mist and mellow fruitfulness, talking to her. Uh, and so Keats is in this poem, but he, he never actually kind of appears. He's kind of an interesting uh, audience that seems um, almost detached in some ways from what he's seeing. And 
I love particularly in this in this beginning, uh, the first stanza that uh, the way he uses language and really so many of the resources of language, syntax, diction, um, to really uh, get this idea of fullness and a fact of over brimming. Right. So we've got filling all fruit with ripeness to the core, swell the gourd, plump the hazel shell. You ident- You look at these at these verbs. Right. Set budding more and still more. Um, I'm actually struck this as a new kind of resonance for me. We actually just had our first uh, harvest of honey from two hives that I've been Mm -hmm. keeping. Got uh, uh, six gallons of honey. And, you know, there is that sense. It's such a lovely uh, image that he ends this first stanza with of, you know, that the bees who just work like mad, you know, all all summer, you know, must, they must think, boy, it's another hot day. I got to fill more of these things, you know, and just that that sense of it's got to it's got to come to an end. There's this sense of inevitability. Things are as full as they could possibly be. You you have very much. He's so good at um, at weight, which is a difficult thing. You know, remember that um, what soft incense hangs upon the boughs in in the nightingale ode. You know, and, and it's the same idea here. This you you get the image of uh, of branches bending with huge apples, you know, and, and, and shells and gourds about to break open, you know, and so this, this, these images of plentitude and, and this really sets him up for this idea of, you know, that the harvest, you know, has to happen, you know, it, it, it's interesting that, um, particularly coming off of urn, where that idea that, uh, you have something that is frozen, right, so heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter, you know, the happy boughs that never can shed your leaves, right, this idea that you are, that this is, uh, to be admired in a work of art that something is permanent, that it cannot go away. I mean, here it is the opposite, because, autumn as a season is seen as being, uh, it has to, it has to happen. You know, there's, there is no freezing it and there's no sense of, oh, that's great because we can freeze it here. It, there's the, the only option to the harvest is bursting and rotting. And that's not what you want to do. And then, and, and of course, also uh, in the, in the first stanza, the fact that it's one sentence. I mean, you can make an argument because he has a number of uh, end stops that are uh, semicolons, and you could you could end the sentence there, but you don't have to. And and over and over again, he's doing this. You know, he's not he's not end stopping a line like in your in, in the third conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit. There's the sense of there's more to say. There's more in the image than the line can contain. So the form of the of these stanzas is, is kind of imitating the content Absolutely. of this harvest. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, and then and then in the second stanza, which is probably kind of the most famous thing about this poem that people tend to identify, is this idea uh, uh, of autumn as a, as a woman, um, and you have these lines that are just so extraordinary, right? Thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind. What a fantastic uh, 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 image is here of the wind that w- that is gentle enough to is easy that you can so that you can winnow, but strong enough so that it'll it'll blow some of the husks away, and that you can uh, separate the kernel from the shell. And and you have this image of autumn as a as a woman with this long hair kind of lifting up, you know, and holding up in the air. There's this wonderful kind of suspension uh, that's taking place there. And and what's happening in the course of this stanza? is that autumn is engaged in its own harvest. There's this sense that autumn is is capturing and holding and preserving everything uh, that has been growing throughout the season so that you have um, you know, the, it engaged in, you know, it's storing things in a granary of, uh, you know, reaping and so on. But actually, Autumn in these sort of snapshot moments throughout the stanza is not actually doing these things. It's actually caught in a moment of rest. So it's actually, so Autumn is sitting careless on a granary floor. Um, it's on a half furrow, but it is drowsed by the fume of poppies and sound asleep. Right, um, and so it is sparing the next swath as opposed to actually doing the reaping, and even though it is gleaning the fields, um, it is uh, actually keeping those gleanings steady with thy laden head. So uh, the idea is that autumn has filled the receptacle of some sort and is preserving and keeping these things. Um, so the the first stanza too, when you go back and look at time and how time is, is I, I think it's pretty clear that we're moving through the season, but we're also moving through the day, 
because in the first stanza we're talking about the maturing sun, right? And early in the season. The second stanza is kind of the midday. It's the noon stanza. And so this is where uh, Autumn is kind of taking a nap in the middle of the day. Um, and as these images go through, it's getting more and more uh, towards, you know, towards the end of the season because the actions of the harvester are progressing in time as well. Um, it, it really is just, it's just extraordinary the way that, it's, that it, it is constructed. It's, and, and in a lot of ways, this, um, this poem is more like a song or a symphony than it is like an argument, like a philosophical argument. It's a series of, of orchestrated images that are working together, that are progressing and, and showing this sort of uh, the inevitability and the tremendous uh, uh, appeal of a process that's unfolding kind of before our eyes. And then what I think of as being, you know, the ultimate heroic line of this poem in the, is the one that begins the third stanza. Where the songs of spring, I, where are they? And then think not of them, thou hast thy music too, right? You know, I mean, it is here that as far as I'm concerned, uh, this is where I see Keats in, in his personal life really achieving a kind of transcendence that was the goal of you know, kind of the romantic movement in some ways, you know, through all of the, the pushing and, and the, and the, and the straining of those previous odes, you know, like in Nightingale, you know, you know, when he gets to that point, already with the tenders the night, you know, there's this push to get there, but here it's, it's more of a sigh. It's more of a sense of, you know, well, yes, yeah, springtime was great. Yeah. I loved it when it was spring. I love being out here, you know, when I could remember, that there was going to be a sun and it would be warm enough for me to finally be putting on a short sleeve shirt. Yeah, that was great, the songs of spring. But you know what? It's not spring anymore. It's autumn. So don't think of the songs of spring. Think about your... So the, the poem really ends with the idea of a sunset, right? So you talk about the soft dying day right, and the rosy hue that's touching the stubble plains. So now, you know, look how, how subtly he's done that, right? Now he's taken you to the end of the day, because the sunset, and the sunset is uh, glowing on the stubble plains, so the fields have been harvested, you know, so that that's come to completion. And then in the final sort of peroration of this, of this ode, you know, the wailful choir, now wailful is one of the few words here that is demonstrating the acceptance of, uh, you know, it's not only beauty, but we are there, we are talking about death here, right? This is the season of death. And so, and the small gnats are mourning, right? So that sound of, of, of gnats is mourning. Um, and, it, it, but, but it's still, there's still life here. I mean, if you look at this line, there, there's things here that seem just ex amazing to me. I know I'm using the word amazing, extraordinary, and, and maybe I, I get it's sort okay. of offended the way that people overuse the word amazing and awesome. The, that's my personal indication that I'm getting too old is when I hear people use those words. It brings out the cr crotchety part of me. But this, I suppose as I want to reserve it for things like this poem. Because look at what he's doing with, with uh, as he brings in sort of, you know, the end read death of the season, that it is still breathing, right? In a wailful choir, the small gnats mourn among the river sallows borne aloft or sinking as the light wind lives and dies, right? The, those lines, they continue longer than you expect them to. And, and they do have a sense of just, you know, because we're talking about rising and falling, there's the sense of breathing, you know, of inspiration, you know, in both, both means, uh, meanings of that word. And then the final sounds, right? Full-grown lambs, right? Bleeding, hedge crickets, and then this final kind of single solitary red breast whistles and swallows, you know, that gather and twitter, and in my imagination, anyway, there's that sound of that sense of community of gathering together, and then the sound of a twitter in the skies is something that I can imagine just you know disappearing like a Tibetan bell, you know, just sort of finally fades away. Um, admirers of this poem, you know, will say have said things like you know this is the most perfect poem in the English language, and um, I love this poem deeply. Um, but I'm not sure that I want to, you know, assign it a grade. Um, but I do think that the poem, if if it speaks to you, it's going to speak all you really need to bring to this poem. You don't need to have much information about negative capability or Keats's life or, um, you know, sort of 
what's going on in, in uh, the critical circles at the time he's writing. I mean, this is a poem that anybody who, can, who knows the words, you have to know that much about it. Uh, if you go outside at the end of the season and listen to this poem and allow yourself to hear it, it's going to do its work with just that. And um, I think that's, that's why I love this poem and why I see it as being you know, such uh, an appropriate, such a heroic, such a wonderful way for Keats to have his last word on this subject. Now, of course, Keats' life didn't end this happily. He died a little after a year, a little more than a year after he wrote this, and he died in, you know, in great pain in London, where he'd, I mean, in Rome, where he'd gone to try to escape, um, you know, tuberculosis, where he was uh, trying to hide the fact that he had it because he wouldn't have been able, able to stay in his lodgings. Evidently, when Keats was finally, um, you know, his last words were, thank God the end has come at last, and when the doctors opened him up, they couldn't figure out how he had been breathing because yeah. there was basically nothing left. I mean, it was a terrible end to his life. But he, I believe that he knew that uh, he knew that that was coming. You know, he was trained as a doctor. He had plenty of experience uh, working with people who had undergone all sorts of physical trauma, and he had watched what happened to his brother. He knew it was coming, and the fact that he could find a poem of this uh, dignity and beauty and power, and that he had this in him at the age of 24 to be the last thing that he wanted to leave of his poetical self, uh, to me, is an, an extraordinary achievement. Something that you mentioned earlier was, and perhaps we addressed this in another seminar that we did, was uh, that he wasn't um, critically well-received, mm -hmm. and that, that, that his reputation has only grown in time. I'm kind of curious, what were what was the initial reception? Well, what... And, and, why, and why, I mean, why they were skeptical of what he was making. So it was just because of his age. Was well, it no, it was, it was social class, too. Uh, well, it was three things. It was his age, it was his social class, because he was not really of the social class who was expected to write poems. Um, and um, and it was also because a lot of his earlier poetry was pretty bad. Mm. I mean, you know, it, it, we have this idea of oh, genius you that, you know, yeah. I mean, you know, that I mean, he, his earliest stuff was, you know, very much imitations of Spencer, um, and it was overly influenced by Lee Hunt, uh, who was uh, uh, of strong influence on him. And so, and, and so much of his earliest stuff, and, and one of the things that evidently did seem to happen is that, you know, Keats has this reputation of, you know, oh, they were, he was treated so badly. Byron and Don Juin said, you know, the most cruel thing, which was, you know, that Keats was snuffed out by an article, right? This idea of, you know, oh, someone wrote a bad uh, review of my poetry. Oh, I am slain, right? And fall down, die. And that's not what happened at all. You know, I mean, Keats, I think, was very uh, measured in terms of understanding. Yeah, okay, well, you know, some people are being a little harsh, but maybe it wasn't all that good. And, you know, that, that wasn't, I think, what was most important to him. What did happen after this uh, were a couple things. One is actually that the poet Percy Shelley wrote a poem called Adonais about John Keats. And uh, and Shelley's star was rising at this time, too. And so Adonais became um, part of the, the reason that people went back to Keats. Mm. I don't know, uh, I don't know enough about it to know whether whether the odes would have been uh, recognized and, uh, you know, discovered the way that they were without, um, you know, without Shelley uh, having written that poem. I, don't, I just don't know enough about it to know. Um, but there's also certainly, you know, the, one of the, the basic uh, um, appeals of the romanti of a romanticism it was the idea that your reach should always exceed your grasp, right? That if you've totally achieved something, it probably wasn't worth going for in the first place. And for Keats to be writing at this level, um, at 24 and then dying, that certainly fed into the romantic appeal of the man himself. Like, what a poet he would have been, what extraordinary poems he's, uh, he never wrote, you know. Right. So there's a little bit of um, uh, forecasting that's going on when you're, when you're reading these things. You can, you're trying to like, oh, if he had only lived longer, you're projecting out yeah. about what he would have done. And I think you can make an argument that, um, you know, that what Keats was doing with, for example, sonnet form, where he's actually combining two sonnet forms into the forms of the odes, um, you know, what he does with, you know, with his imagery and, and to take sort of what, what Spencer had done and to make it more modern and more, um, you know, more accessible. I, I think you could make an argument that there's a lot uh, that Keats did that was revolutionary and tremendously important on its own. But this poem, more than any of them, I think, is a poem that utterly stands on its own. I mean, you don't need to know anything about Keats, anything about the previous poems, anything about anything 
to really feel that this poem, you know, captures uh, the sounds, the sights, the images, uh, and the process of the season in a remarkably short time, uh, and it, it does a magnificent job at it. Yeah. Well, it's fantastic. Thank you as always, Hunt. I really appreciate it. And I'll have this available online and on the Noetic app very soon. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Luke. Bye.